Okay. On February 2nd, Groundhog Day, the outdoor crew came upon an interesting but grisly sight. It was a sunny, cold morning. They had snowshoed toward the top of the block so as to work down so they would be close to the van when they finished their rows, uh, when they finished their rows near lunchtime. As they made their way uh, up ahead, they noticed a dark object in the snow that appeared to be a dead animal. As they got closer, they saw, they saw that indeed it was a dead porcupine. It looked peculiar, like a deflated pelt lying on the snow. There was a little blood visible on the snow around the edges, but less than, than might be expected for an animal that had been killed by a predator. Brock pointed out the tracks. There were two sets, one the porcupines and a set of fisher tracks leading up to the porcupine. Brock pointed out that, uh, uh, that the fisher tracks stopped at a hole in the snow about a yard from the dead porcupine. Fisher cats, that's what they call them in New Hampshire, uh, are, only, uh, are the only predators of porcupines. They only attack them if they find them walking on deep snow, which is pretty rare, Brock said. Uh, Stephen, Stephen knew that porcupines moved slowly like a sloth. So, Brock explained, the fisher would have time to burrow under the snow and uh, to attack the porcupine from underneath, where there are no quills. Brock lifted the stiff, frozen pelt off the snow with his pruning pole, revealing a blood-soaked tunnel leading back to the fisher, fisher's entrance. He pointed out to the rest of the crew how, mo how almost everything but the skin and quills was gone, that the fisher had even chewed up and eaten the bones. The pelt was almost clean enough to tan. Stephen thought it would be fun to keep it, get some borax and try to tan it and make a hat with it. How fun it would be to have a porcupine skin hat, Stephen thought. Okay, now here's a picture. Here's the picture of that day. As you can see the the uh, porcupine, there's the hole in the ground where the fisher entered and then goes under, under there and attacks the porcupine from underneath. Okay. Do you mind if I keep this? I'm going to try to tan it and make a hat out of it. Wouldn't that be funny? Stephen said. <laughs> be my guest, Brock said. Uh, said Brock, chuckling. Stephen lifted the pelt off the hook of, the, of Brock's pruning pole, careful not to get stuck by the quills. He rolled it up inside out and put it in the snow next to his thermos at the base of his tree and started pruning. At break, he would bring it down to the van. He was, going to be, he was going to be the only person who he knew who had a porcupine skin hat. Stephen leaned uh, the long pruning pole in the crook of a branch and used his saw to prune what he could from his snowshoes. Now, uh, he went from one branch to the next, starting close to the trunk and working outward. The thin, fine-toothed blade cut neatly through the hard, uh, hard apple wood with a satisfying zip, leaving a smooth cut. He cut whippy suckers with just one push stroke. He made his way around the tree, tamping down, uh, down the snow with his snowshoes. Then he removed the snowshoes and climbed the tree to get the upper layers. When he'd uh, done what he could with the saw, he climbed back down, put on his snowshoes, and used the pruning pole to get the small branches he could not get with the saw. All the while, he thought about uh, he thought about the porcupine and the fisher. Imagine that. That fisher cat burrowed under the snow to get that porcupine, he said to himself. On the drive back to the packing house, Brock said he'd known about uh, he'd known about fishers eating porcupines, but had never actually seen a real example of it, and with the tunnel intact. For the time being, Stephen's parents were letting him drive their car to work. They had two cars, and Mrs. Stroh rarely drove any more. Stephen often used the car to do the family errands. Even, at the, uh, uh, even driving his mother to dialysis 
when she had to do it at the hospital. Stephen knew that soon he would have to get his own car. He knew he'd have to move out on his own soon. That night, when he got home, Stephen put the rolled-up porcupine pelt in a brown paper shopping bag and tucked it into the snow outside the basement, room, basement bedroom door to keep it frozen. He would tan it on the weekend. His mother had prepared dinner, and Stephen ate with his parents. He told them about the porcupine, that, uh, that a fisher cat had eaten it, but he didn't mention that he was going to make a hat out of the skin. He thought it would be better not to mention that. He went to bed tired, but it was that good kind of tired from having worked hard all day, but also having learned something and enjoyed the day. Seeing that dead porcupine and having learned the story behind it, he realized that Brock was a very smart man, having put all the clues together like a detective would have done. Stephen heard that Brock had been to college at the University of Massachusetts, where he had studied agriculture. As Stephen lay awake in his bed, his thoughts drifted to an event that had happened seven years earlier, when he was twelve. Mrs. Franklin had been a mean old lady. All the kids who lived on Filbert Hill went fishing in Franklin's pond. It was a big pond, maybe half a mile across, uh, beyond the woods, beyond her house. Route 101 went by the far side of it. Uh, there were largemouth bass, pickerel, yellow perch, and at night you could catch eels and catfish. Uh, to walk there from Stephen's neighborhood, the children would cross a big horse pasture and cross a stone wall to another field. At the bottom of that field was another stone wall which ran alongside Old Birmingham Road. Uh, road. Mrs. Franklin's house was on the opposite side of that road. The shortest way to get to the pond was down Mrs. Franklin's driveway, which cut the corner to Route 101. If you could not take that shortcut, you'd have to walk half a mile back down to uh, Old Birmingham Road to where it joined Route 101, and then start walking more than half a mile back toward the pond. It more than doubled the walk. All the kids in the neighborhood went fishing there, and they all went, uh, would attempt to go down Mrs. Franklin's driveway first scouting from behind the stone wall, walking when the coast was clear. But whenever she saw the kids, she would come out, uh, come out the door shouting and ranting. The kids just ran away down to the pond. She never left her yard, so once at the pond, the kids knew they were safe. She had never, she had never talked to any of the parents, so the parents were unaware that their children had been doing this. Years had gone by, and it had become routine. It was just how one got to Franklin's Pond from up the hill. Then one day, Stephen and Matthew, who would have been 16 at the time, were going fishing. They crossed the field, crouched behind the stone wall, and watched to see if Mrs. Franklin was outside working in her yard. The walk down, to, down her driveway to the pond was like a beautiful park, uh, lined with flowers and trees, perfectly tended. This day, they didn't see her outside, so they crept over the stone wall and walked cautiously down the driveway. Her house was set about 50 feet back from the road, and the driveway went past the kitchen door, which was up a staircase on the second floor over the garage. Just as they were approaching the house, the kitchen door opened. But this time it wasn't Mrs. Franklin yelling. There was no yelling. What emerged from the door was a ferocious boxer dog, full grown. It charged down the stairs and up to the two boys, growling and baring its teeth. Stephen froze. He had no, no idea of how to react, but knew it was dangerous to run away. The dog approached snarling threateningly, looking like uh, any second it would pounce. Stephen experienced a flood of adrenaline in his system for the first time and became unaware of his body. His consciousness stopped existing in the world of the, with the dangerous dog. For him, it was as if he were watching it in a movie. He stood motionless, blank-faced. 
Matthew kept his cool. He saw that something was not right with Stephen. Stephen did not respond to what Matthew said. Matthew knew he had to protect Stephen. He reached out and put his hand on Stephen's shoulder. Stephen, don't worry. That dog is made of silly putty. Matthew said in a slow, calm, but serious voice, he's not going to attack you. Just keep looking at it. Keep calm and slowly back away. Matthew placed himself between the dog, Stephen and uh, between the dog and the young Stephen, facing the dog down, branding, brandishing his fishing pole as if it were a weapon. All the while, Matthew could see Mrs. Franklin watching from the almost closed kitchen door. Stephen came to his senses, and the two boys slowly backed away to the top of the driveway to the road, and the dog backed off. As Stephen lay in bed that night so many years later, he recalled that while he'd been scared, Matthew had been angry. Mrs. Franklin had gone too far. Matthew promised Stephen that, uh, that they would get even with her. Matthew secretly planned that fall on Halloween they would get revenge. Matthew had to protect his brother from, from real danger. It was a matter, a matter of honor. Matthew had gotten an M80 at school. That's a giant firecracker. They say is an eighth of a stick of dynamite. Stephen had heard about them, but had never actually seen one. The plan was to blow up Mrs. Franklin's mailbox. That Halloween, around midnight, long after all the young children in the neighborhood had finished trick-or-treating, Stephen, his brother Philip, who was 14 at the time, and Matthew, uh, snuck out of their basement room, in the basement bedroom. They crept down the road to the horse field, through the matted frost-covered grass, to the stone wall across the road from Mrs. Franklin's house. The moon was full, and the moonlight looked uh, beautiful to Stephen. It was very exciting. Matthew explained how to make a simple time-delay fuse using a cigarette. You light the cigarette, poke a hole somewhere along its length, depending on how long you want the delay to be, and insert the fuse of the firecracker into the hole. When the cigarette burns to the fuse, it will ignite the M80. So here's a picture of that kind of set up with an M80. There's a cigarette, and you have the M80 there. The fuse comes out the side of those things. So anyway, that's what, what uh, Matthew showed Stephen. Okay. The three boys huddled behind the stone wall just across the street from Mrs. Franklin's house. Matthew carefully lit the cigarette, cupping his hands around the flame to avoid being seen. He had taped the M80 to a strip of corrugated cardboard with its fuse held up. He poked a tiny hole in the cigarette and fitted it onto the fuse. Everything was ready. Okay, this one's for you. Put it in the mailbox and close it tight, Matthew whispered to Stephen. Stephen was nervous, holding the strip of cardboard with the glowing cigarette and the little red bomb the size of a wine cork. But he was also excited. It was thrilling to really be doing something like this. It felt like being a commando. Stephen held the piece of cardboard like a tray with a cup of tea. He crept over the stone wall silent, silently, careful not to make noise. He was privately a little proud of his skill at moving silently, even with the crunchy, uh, tr crunchy dried leaves on the ground. He snuck across the road, carefully opened the mailbox door, and slid the cardboard onto the floor of the mailbox, bending its sides so it would fit. Now here's the picture that goes along with that. This is, they were preparing the, the M80 there, and that's Mrs. Lincoln's house across the street. And so that's Matthew lighting the cigarette and Stephen holding the, the cardboard. Okay. He softly shut the mailbox door and crept back across the road. He managed his way over the stone wall to his brothers. 
He had, he had done his job without a sound. They all snuck back up the hill to watch from a distance. Together they sat on the grass and waited. Stephen could see further down that someone had smashed pumpkins in the road, and there was toilet paper draped over the power lines, glowing blue in the moonlight. Minutes went by. Time stood still. Stephen wondered how long it would take for the thing to go off. Maybe it's a dud, Philip whispered. Maybe we should go check it. No, don't, <laughs> don't check it. Just wait. It'll go off, Matthew whispered. They continued to wait. Then, BAM! Okay. The blast was shockingly loud and powerful much more powerful than Stephen had expected. It echoed through the valley for se several seconds. Stephen suddenly felt scared at what he'd done. He realized that this was not just a prank. It was a crime. He'd set off a bomb. It also crossed his mind that had that thing gone off early, even resting on the cardboard, he might have lost his hand. It was that powerful. The next day was Sunday. All the kids still living at home had to go to church with mom and dad. They'd all got uh, they all they'd all gotten in the Volkswagen bus with the three guilty boys next to their innocent brother Patrick in the first back seat. Mrs. Mrs. Stroh rode in the front passenger seat. They all saw the toilet paper wound around the telephone wires and the uh, and trees and the smashed pumpkins. Somebody had written a swear word on the road with what looked like shaving cream. All of this was the same every year, and as with every year, their father got into a rage. Look at what those damn kids did. I tell you, if any of you ever do anything like that, that'll be the end of it. Then they went by Mrs. Franklin's house. Look what they did to Mrs. Franklin's mailbox. That's outrageous, he shouted. Stephen was shocked to see what he had done. In the daylight, it was plain to see. As the Volkswagen bus drove by, he saw that the mailbox was completely blown out, ripped metal peeled back, the door dangling from its hinge. He, it reminded Stephen of a picture in one of his father's history books of a World War I artillery piece whose shell had exploded in the barrel. And here's the picture of the mailbox the next morning. All right. Well, those punks are going to find out how stupid they were. Her son is Judge Franklin. They're going to ferret out, uh, ferret that one out real quick. I bet you it was those Roberge boys, Mr. Stroh shrieked. That Sunday, church came and went. Stephen had the afternoon free and rode his bicycle to a place called Fairy's Bathtub. Uh, where in the open season he fished for brook trout. But the day after Halloween was closed season for trout. Stephen just wanted to be in the woods. That was many years ago. Nothing had come of it in the ensuing years. As Stephen lay in bed, tired after pruning apple trees all day in the freezing cold, thinking about the porcupine pelt, he, remember, he remembered back again uh, at, that after... He remembered back then that after that night, he'd expected some scandal about it, that the police might actually investigate the incident, as his father had said. He had worried about that, but nothing happened except that the kids never saw that dog again. Nobody came around asking questions about where the kids had been that night. For Stephen, it didn't matter that the dog was gone. He had, uh, he had never snuck down... Mrs. Franklin's driveway after that. When he'd gotten a decent bicycle, the shortcut had become irrelevant. Just before he drifted off to sleep, he vaguely remembered hearing a rumor that Mrs. Franklin had complained to her son, the judge, to do something, and that Judge Franklin had rebuked his mother, telling her that there wasn't going to be any investigation. It was Halloween, after all, the time for settling scores. The first question in any such investigation would be, who would have a motive to do it? The answer would have been every child who lived on the hill. Mrs. Franklin had unnecessarily made enemies, and they were all children. 
Why on earth had she made such a point of denying us a shortcut to the pond? Stephen wondered. But he wasn't sure if he'd really heard that rumor or had just imagined it. His thoughts continued as to why Mrs. Franklin had been the way she was. Stephen's mother and lots of the other neighbor ladies were all great gardeners. All of their yards were like botanical gardens you might see in uh, you might see pictures of in gardening books. Mrs. Franklin, uh, Mrs. Franklin could have been an upstanding member of that group if she'd wanted to, but she was distant and private. In fact, Stephen wondered if his mother had ever even met Mrs. Franklin. That uh, the thought occurred to Stephen that uh, that he had been an impressionable young man. On his own, he would never have thought of such revenge against Miss, uh, Mrs. Franklin. He would have just stopped using her driveway. But he'd gone along with Matthew's plan, and he realized even then that they would have, but they would have been in serious trouble had they been caught. He mumbled to himself, "Are you still like that, Stephen?" At that thought, Stephen drifted off to sleep. Okay, I'm going to take a break here.